Hi. Well, I'm excited you're here as well. We're in week number three of this series called Rhythm. How many of you enjoying the beginning of your year? Is it in rhythm? Are you in stride yet? Yeah, yeah. We're in the second, go moving into the third week of our prayer and fasting. We'll even talk a little bit about that today, but I'm excited to jump into um, today's topic. I got six different rhythms to talk to you about, the practicing the ways of Jesus. And here's the thought, man. The thought behind this is instead of trying like a New Year's resolution or a list of things or rules to follow, what if we just kind of peeled it back and just focused on walking with Jesus? What if we focused on modeling after him and staying in rhythm with him? I believe that the outcome of our life would be like maybe those goals and resolutions and those things that you want. And maybe God wants some of that too. But that's actually an outcome of us walking with Jesus and being in step with Jesus. So let me show you this theme verse in Matthew chapter 11, and I'll tell you where we're going to today. Matthew chapter 11 says this, Jesus speaking. He says, are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? And some of you here maybe have tried religion or tried church or tried faith, and it just really wasn't working that much for you. And Jesus is like, okay, have you tried all that stuff? Okay, why don't you just come to me? Because Christianity is in a religion, it's a relationship. And maybe we've been going about this thing wrong. Maybe we've been trying to do Christianity and faith wrong. Maybe Jesus' invitation isn't to follow a certain set of rules, but to actually know him and to follow him. He says, look, when you're done, are you done with that now? Why don't you come to me and get away with me, and this is how you're going to recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk, walk with me and walk, work with me and watch how I do it. He said, I'm going to be a model for you. My lifestyle, and then he says this, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Wouldn't that be great if you didn't have to force it? You know what I mean? Wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to force being good? Force not sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. Don't punch them in the face. Don't punch them in the face. Don't punch them. What if it just like was like this unforced rhythm that Jesus modeled in his relationship with his father and his, in his faith and how he walked? It was this unforced rhythm of grace that now he invites us into. And he says, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, contrary to maybe some belief that, that there's Christianity's hard or religion is hard. It's a, it's a whole bunch of to-do lists and not to-do lists. And Jesus is rewriting this and going, that's not it. I'm not wanting to lay anything heavy on you. He said, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So in the first two weeks of this series, we're kind of foundational teachings to all of the rhythms and, and what I'm hoping, believing, and praying for, like they're foundational for the rest of your year, that it's going to be different this year, that we're going to have a different rhythm this year. Um, not only are they foundational, but I believe they're kind of like the two railroad tracks. Let me show you a little diagram. This is what I mean. Like, like in week number one, I talked to you about a rhythm of prayer and fasting. And that's why, where we began 21 days of prayer and fasting. We're in the last week. Amen, somebody. Last week of prayer and fasting. But like this year, we're going to have a rhythm of, of intentional time with God, praying and fasting. And not only that, in week number two, last week, we talked about this thing called silence and solitude. And I taught you guys how to have a daily quiet time with God and a weekly Sabbath, like a weekly rest of silence and solitude. And these two things, they create the the tracks for your life, all the other rhythms of Jesus, like where you are going, what you are doing, these two things are the tracks that are going to be foundational for the rest of your year. Today's topic is, I think, it's, it's the rhythm that's going to provide momentum to your locomotive now. Say if you were a train on the tracks and you got prayer and fasting and silence and solitude. Now the rhythm I'm going to talk to you about today determines what direction your life is headed in on these tracks. It determines the destination that you're actually going to arrive in, how fast you're going and the momentum that you have. Today's rhythm is a rhythm of God's word, the word of God. Uh, the title of the message, I think, is, was uh, building a life built on the word of God is what I called it, a life that is built upon the word of God. And, and I, I got... A very clear, maybe not too simple, but a clear goal for you today. After our time together, this is my hope. That you would fall in love with the word of God. 
For some of you maybe fall back in love with the word of God. That you would love it, learn it, and live it. That's my hope today. My hope is that you would love it, that you'd want to learn it, and you'd actually live it out. Let me show you, show you why. Psalm chapter 1, which is the biggest book of the Bible. There's 119 chapters in it, and a lot of it has to do with the Word of God. And it begins the book. This psalm begins, the whole book begins, talking about this topic. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. He says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, so who's not in the wrong rhythm, who has the wrong step. He's, a, he's not in rhythm with God. He's actually out of step. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or, ta or take or sit, in the si or sit in the company of mockers. I'll get it right. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates. We're going to come back to that word. Remember that. Who meditates on his law day and night. Then he describes this person that is like meditating, not walking in the wrong foot, but actually in the right rhythm, not off step with God. He describes this person. He says, this person who's got the rhythm is, is like a tree planted by streams of water. So they're healthy. They're a healthy, thriving tree that yields fruit, that is fruitful in season, and whose leaf does not wither. And whatever they do is good. It's prosperous, whatever they do. That Hebrew word for prospers there is, is the word selech. It means to rush, to advance, or to succeed. Now look, you need to get this, this rhythm of the word of God operating in your life. If you're going to get this locomotive, this train moving in the right direction, advancing in the right direction. We need the rhythm of God's word. It's going to determine your direction and your destination. In life. So you can have the prayer and fasting thing and the silence and solitude thing, but if you don't have this, you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong direction. This guy came up to me a while back after church and um, he said, Pastor, I love the talk you gave. And I can always tell that people aren't familiar with church when they call what I do a talk. They're like, I love the talk that you gave. And, and he said, I, just, I, love, I love how you just you put all the words on the, on the, the screen, the monitor too. That was, just re that was really cool. And He's like, I got a question though. What was that, what was that, like the name at the bottom with the numbers? And so he thought I was putting some of my words on the screen. And, 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 he, and he said this, he says, and, and, and what's the dot dot? What's the dot? So he called the call. And, uh, <laughs> and it was so cool to me. I was like, it was encouraging to me because I was like, man, we're reaching people who like are so, don't know maybe what, like a lot of you take for granted. And uh, maybe some of you are here like, yeah, tell me what the dot dot is. I've been wondering here, what in the world? I'm going to help you out. So what I told him, I was like, oh, I was so excited. I was just like, oh, that's so cool. Well, when the, when the Bible was originally author, authored by God but penned by man, it was just one book. It was a lot of books, but they were just written in, in like with no breaks at all. And so the translators decided to help us study it, know it, and go back to it a lot easier. They decided to kind of separate it out. So the first word that you see is usually the name of the book. It's the name of the book. Sometimes it's the name of the person that's writing the book. In this case, Psalm. And then the other two numbers are the chapter and the verse. So the translators broke it down by chapter and verse to help us find stuff easier. So this is chapter 1 and the verses 1 through 3. And he goes, wow, that's so smart. And he goes, he goes did you think of that? I said, I sure did. I immediately was like, no, I said, no, no, no. It's just, that's been happening for a long time. That's been, that's been like that. But I just loved seeing the joy on this guy's face of like, of, of wanting to know about the word and learn the word of God. Do you remember when you used to get excited about your word? Do you remember it, man? I want to recapture that. For some of you, I want you to capture it the first time to love and live and learn the word of God. Here's what Jesus claimed about the Bible. John chapter 6, verse 63. This is what Jesus said. The words I have spoken to you are spirit. So it's not just a word coming out of my mouth. It's, they're spirit and life. And that word spirit, the, the, translate, tr the, the Greek word, your New Testament was written in Greek. The Greek word is pneuma. There's not really a good English word for this Greek word. P-N-E-U-M-A. Literally, it translates breath, but what it literally means in this context is the breath of God. So 
So it's not just a word. God never just says a word. When he, when, he, when he speaks his word, he also has his breath alongside of it, which is the power of God that accompanies alongside the thing that is spoken. So when God speaks, he never just speaks a word. He always speaks and gives the power alongside the word to accomplish the purpose that the word spoke. Oh, you see that? Okay, guys. So, so this, which makes this book like any, none other book in the world, that his words have the breath of God, the power of God. They are spirit and able to bring life is what he says. So this makes this word alive, right? Hebrews chapter 4 actually tells us, Hebrews 4, 12, I, I showed you this last week. It says, for the word of God is what? It's a living, breath. this is not just a historical record. There's history in here, sure, but this isn't just a historical record. This is not just an accumulation of people's writings and thoughts. It is the word of God. If you want to get to know God, you must get to know his word. See, prayer is you talking to God, but the word is God talking to you. So both are extremely important. You can't have one without the other, and usually people prioritize one over the other, but that doesn't matter. You need them both. You need the word of God in your life for the word of God is living and active it's sharper than any double-edged sword what what that means is it will do surgery on you it, it'll do a deep healing a penetrating work in your life even dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart so one of the tragedies that people experience in reading the word though is that it's it may be confusing to them or maybe it's even like I don't get much out of it like it's a little mundane so I'm not really getting a lot out of what I'm reading. So I want to help you out with that today, man. I want you to love it, learn it, and live it. So I'm going to do two things today. I, I want to give you the theology of the Bible, like how the Bible can come alive. A theology of how the Bible can come alive. So I'm going to teach you a little bit. And then I'm going to get really practical in how you can have a rhythm of God's word this year and get moving in the right direction. And actually at the end of this year, arrive at a very good, at God's destination. For you to be at the place where God wants you to be. Does that sound good, you guys? Okay. So, so this is in your notes. If you want to go to your notes, if you're not going to take notes with us, just write a few things down. And it will help you have the Bible come alive. In order for the Bible to come alive, number one, you got to have this faith thing. Because faith activates the word of God. So faith is what causes the Bible to come alive. Faith is this belief. It's this supernatural belief in God and what he is saying that actually starts to activate that thing. So you say, well, Jason, do I really have to believe it? Can I just not read it and not get the same thing out of it? Yes, faith is what actually brings power and activates the word of God in your life. Let me show it to you in Hebrews chapter 4. He says, for we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. So they had the same gospel preached to them, the same message. But the message they heard was actually of no value to them. Because those who heard that message, the same message, they didn't combine what they heard with faith. So you got the same message going out to to different people, but one of them has no power coming alongside that word because they didn't combine faith with what they were hearing. So faith is what activates the word of God in our life. So some people, that may frustrate you because you're like, okay, well, not only is it hard for me to read the Bible... But it's hard for me to believe too. So I'm, I'm stuck here. This is hard. It's hard for me to read and understand, but it's hard for me to believe. I'm going to help you out because there's something that actually activates faith in your life. And it's this thing right here. Revelation activates faith. In other words, if you want your faith to come alive where you can actually believe what you're reading, this has to happen. This revelation thing has to happen. In other words, it has to go, aha, uh-huh. aha. Uh-huh. Or, 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 or where it's like, oh my goodness, I see it. And some of you probably had that experience where you've read your Bible, you're reading your Bible, you come across that passage before, you've heard it before, you've read it before, but in that moment of reading it, something came alive to you and you went, oh my goodness, I see it now. I, I see it. In fact, there are two words for the word word in the Greek. So in your Bible, I know it's a little, fun, that's fine. There's two words, anytime you see the word word in your New Testament, There are two different Greek words that may be used. The first is the word logos, the Greek word logos, which is the written word of God. And many people only get this one. They get the logos. They get the written or maybe even the verbal, like what I'm 
I'm speaking to you about the Logos written word of God. So some of you are going to leave here and go, man, that was for me. Woo, I got a lot out of that. And others of you are going to leave here and go, I didn't get it. Uh, it's just not my kind of message today, you know, kind of thing. And so what's going on? It's the same word, but one of you have one of you are not receiving it with faith, and therefore it's not activating, it's not becoming valuable to you. So we're all getting the same logos, but not everyone's getting the Rhema. The Rhema, where where you see it, where it's revealed to you. Well, how do you get that? I'm actually gonna show you. I'm gonna show you how you can act. there's something you can do that will get more aha moments in your devotion time, in your walk with Jesus. There's actually something that you can do that can activate where you get more revelation happening from God, more of the, oh my gosh, I see it. That can happen more in your walk with Jesus. But let me show you first where a biblical example where revelation actually, rhema, was at work. And it's a very familiar passage of scripture. Those of you that may not even read your Bible much, probably familiar with this story because it's the Christmas story. It's where the angel Gabriel goes to Mary, who's a teenager, and says, Hey, Mary, you're going to conceive a child, even though you haven't laid with anybody. And the baby that you're going to give birth to is actually going to be God. And so she says in Luke chapter 1, 34, she says, What? (laughs) How will this be? So she heard the word, but she didn't understand it yet. It wasn't rhema. She didn't get it yet. It wasn't rhema. So she questioned it, which is what a lot of people do. When they read the word and they're not getting the rhema, they end up questioning the word that they're reading instead of receiving the word. So, so she's questioning it. Well, how is that going to help? That's impossible. I'm a virgin. The angel answered, well, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One that's going to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he says this, for no rhema, for no word from God will ever fail. Here's what the angel is saying. Mary, if you can just get this word I'm telling you, if you can see it, if you can grab it, if you can grab the, the revelation right now, man, it'll come alive inside of you. And I'm going to speak that. Can I speak that over every one of you? No word from God will ever fail in your life if you can receive it. If you get it, it'll never fail in your life. So it's, it's at this moment that something clicks And that aha moment happens right here for Mary. And she says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word, there it is again, may your revelation, may the rhema to me be fulfilled. And at that moment, she conceives a child. At the moment that she received the rhema, she did not get impregnated by God on the onset of the angel saying what's going to happen. The angel had to say, Mary, you got to get the rhema. You, if you get this, and Mary says, let it be, and right there she gets impregnated by the, are you seeing this, you guys? This is the power of revelation, that revelation activates our, our, our faith. So, so, okay, let's go back. How does the Bible come alive? Faith. Well, how do, you, how do you activate faith? Revelation. Which begs the question then, well, then how do I get revelation in my life? Which I did all that to bring you back to this one word we started with. Meditation activates revelation. Meditation, meaning like, so probably the first pass over that scripture, you're probably not going to get it. You're going to have to, listen, you're going to have to slow down. You're going to have to think about that word a little bit. You're going to have to stop on it. You're going to have to ponder it. You're going to have to meditate on it. Go back over it. Think it out with others. Talk about it with others, which is why I give you sermon note handouts every week that are hole punched so that you can go grab a binder from that connection center, put your notes inside that binder, and go back over the logos, the written word of God, and the rhema, what was revealed to you when you wrote that thing down on the side, like, oh my gosh. You can go back over that thing so you can get the power alongside the word so it accomplishes what God intended it to accomplish. We got to, we got to, we got to meditate on it, slow down, think about it. That's all that means, right? Meditation. You don't have to light candles and do any weird thing. It's just thinking, thinking about it, pondering it, sitting on that, that word, meditate on it. That's why we give the, the notes and the handouts. You can go back and meditate on it. And the, and the sermons and the series that we have here at Discovery, they're not like haphazard stuff, man. I'm not just picking topics for you every week. We're going on a spiritual journey for your discipleship and maturation, for your growth. This is, we're going somewhere. This train is going somewhere, you guys. 
All right, and, and, and I strategically and intentionally choose series of teachings that are going to take us in a certain direction. I believe what God wants to do in our life. Let me give you a few. Like this next series that's coming up after, after this one, we got six rhythms to talk about. But on Valentine's Day, we're going to do a relationship series. It's just going to be two weeks, but the first week is going to be about dating. And the second week is going to be about marriage. So I'm going to help you out, like, like I'm going to help you with your dating life. And those of you that know people, that need, like, what does God say about that? What does the wisdom of the Word say about that? How do I do that? Uh, what is, does the world have it right? What does God actually? So I'm going to talk to you about dating. And I'm going to talk about your, your marriage as well. And then after that, we're going to jump into um, a study of the Gospel of John. We're going to study the whole Gospel of John. We're actually going to go through all the miracles in John, ending at the final miracle, the resurrection, on Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then right after that, we got a series that is very controversial and kind of in your face a little bit called Hot Topics, and I'm just going to try to offend everybody with the Word of God. I'm going to talk about stuff that make you uncomfortable, that are like, oh, like what is, uh, I'm, and we're just going to go there. We're going to talk about stuff that's uncomfortable, and, and it's going to be fun, okay? I'm going to have fun. I don't know about you, but I'm going to have fun with it, okay? But this, this is like the journey that God wants us meditating on the word, study that thing. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Again, what is he says, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. But there's that word again, meditate on it day and night. And here's the reason why. He says, so that you'll be prosperous. There's that word again, and successful. So that you can run with energy to the direction that God wants you to go. You got to meditate on this word. Think about it. Let it sit in your mind. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. These words... I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life. So don't treat it like that. Don't treat it as just like incidental additions to your life or homeowner improvements to your standard of living. No, he says this. They are actually foundational words, and I love this. Words to build your life on. We're building our life on the word of God. He says, if you work these words into every area of your life, then you're going to be like a smart carpenter who built his house on a solid rock. He goes on to say that storms are going to come, rain is going to come, wind is going to come, and that happens in life. This year in 2022, more storms are going to come, rain is going to come. We're going to experience different trials and difficulties, relationally, financially, career-wise. This is just life, you guys. I wish I could prevent that from happening. I can't do that. What I can do is get something in your life that when the storm comes and the rain comes and the wind comes, you're standing strong in the middle of it. That's what he says this word is for you. He says that while everybody else's house has fallen, you're going to be standing strong because you built it on the rock. We build our house on the word of God, our life built on the word of God. So how do we do it? Because that's all, in, you know, motivational and stuff. But how do we then now get in the rhythm of building our life on God's word? I got three ways with a bunch of sub points today. <laughs> so I couldn't help myself. I got a lot of, some of them aren't even in your notes. So I hope you're ready to take some notes with me today. Here's, here's how we need to build our life on the word of God and get into a rhythm of God's word. It starts right here. Got to start with this number. Number one, I first got to accept that his word is the authority in my life. Meaning I am not the authority of my life. I do not get to say what is good or bad or wrong or right. No, the government doesn't get to say it. The White House doesn't get to say it. My parents don't get to say it. I got to accept that the word of God is the authority in my life. Someone once said that if the God you worship always agrees with you, then you're probably worshiping yourself. Because <laughs> there's... There's got to be some moments that you come to the word of God and you go, dang it, that sucks. I don't like that. that I, I actually like doing it this way, you know. It, there's, if there's not moments where you're conflicted in your heart about what you're doing or want to do and the authority tells you to do, then there might be something wrong with the way that you're interpreting the word of God or the way that you're following Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 4, which this book was written after the name of the person that it, it was written to. So Paul wrote this book, and he wrote it to Timothy, who was a pastor of a church. He said this. Paul was giving encouragement to Timothy. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus 
Who will judge the living and the dead? God's the judge. I'm not the judge, y'all. You guys ain't the judge. God is the judge. He is the one who's actually going to say what's right and wrong and bring that into account. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom. So he's coming back. <laughs> so he's going to look. So in view of that, I give you this charge. In view of that, I mean, he's the judge and he's going to judge it. And he's coming back one day. Here's what he says. Preach the word, Pastor Timothy. Don't preach anything else. Don't preach what's popular. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. And don't just tell them what they want to hear. Correct and rebuke and encourage as well. And so sometimes my, like, I, it might be strong what I'm saying, but, but that's just because, number one, I love you. But number two, this is the authority in our life. And it should hurt a little bit. If it hurts a little bit, then it just reveals that there is an authority in our life with great patience and careful instruction. For a time will come, he says, when people will not put up with what? Sound doctrine. I think we're living in that day where people aren't putting up with sound doctrine. Instead, here's what's happening, to suit their own desires. What desires? Well, to just live my life the way I want to live my life, sleep with whoever I want to sleep with, you know. Have sex with whoever I want to have sex, love whoever I want to love. Usually it's like sexuality. They will gather around them a great number of teachers and website articles and podcasts and to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from what? The truth. And turn aside to fantasies, myths, to falsehood. Um, I was talking to a woman who a while ago is going to make a drastic, drastic decision in her family. And she asked for my advice. She actually told me, she said, Pastor Jason, you're the one person who has affected my life more than anybody else. And I just have grown so much under your leadership. And I just, I want to know what you think about this. And I was grateful she invited me into the situation. And I'm thinking like, I got a shot here. I already knew what was going on. I'm like, okay. And, I, and so the advice, I, I use the word immoral. That she, what she was going to do, was the, that, that's an immoral decision, I told her. And you really should pray about that, that decision because it doesn't sound like that's, that's what the word of God says. And what she told me was this. Well, pastor, you have your truth and I have my truth. And um, I said, well, hold on. No, truth, truth doesn't change. Okay, one of us is wrong, I told her. And I'm, and I'm happy to be wrong. I'll be wrong. I mean, I'm not saying I have to be right or anything. I'm happy to be wrong. But you've got to tell me through the counsel of God's word why you think that decision is the right one, not on something that's just subjective because truth is absolute. And honestly, you guys, I don't need to be right. I don't have a desire like to be right. I just desire to lead people to Jesus, get them closer to Jesus. I don't need to be right in all this. And it was heartbreaking to be standing and having a conversation with someone that I pastor and I love and I've seen grow and love Jesus, want to live in myth instead of submit to truth. Willfully living in myth. So let me give you three reasons why this happens. Why in our lives maybe we don't submit to the authority of Jesus and the authority of his word, especially in our culture. Number one is human reasoning. Human reasoning. We, we kind of... Uh, live in a world of enlightenment, right? We feel like we've arrived at some like, some like place. We're like, we're just smarter than that now, you know? We've just been enlightened. We know more than archaic stuff like Bible and apostles and Jesus. And like, that's like, you know, there's like, there, I was reading an article by a seminary president that was saying he does not believe in the literal resurrection and miracles and the Bible as authoritative word of God. And this isn't someone who goes to seminary. This is a president of a seminary in our country, and we live in a world right now where people think that they are so smart. They think they have arrived at the, some place of enlightenment. Proverbs 14 and 12 tells us that there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. That is the end of living out that falsehood, that myth is destruction and chaos, which is why if you're in a debate or an argument about truth to someone, stop it. Stop arguing truth. Just, just leave it. Just tell them, like, okay, when you're ready, we'll leave the light on for you. That's it. Because the end result of living that myth and that lie in your own truth is going to be the same. It's the same place that the devil has for every person. Living in a pig pen, eating slop. So eventually, you will, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead you there. Brokenness and despair. And eventually, here, 
we'll leave the light on for you, okay? The light of Jesus, the, the gospel is waiting for you, Christ is waiting for you, but you got to come to that, to that place that you're not that enlightened. Human reasoning, number two, is a heightened focus on self. And we live in this, in this world, in this day and age, like we're so self-focused. We, we, we're, it's about us, whatever maybe feels good for us. Um, there is a spirit that the Bible talks about called the spirit of Babylon or a Babylon mentality. Babylon is not just a location. When you see the word Babylon in the Bible, it's actually a spirit. There's a spirit of Babylon or the mentality of Babylon. It shows up in Genesis chapter 11. And it's actually judged, I didn't put it in your notes, but if you want to go read it, it's judged. That mentality is judged in, in Revelation chapter 17. So it, it's going to be here on the world. This Babylonian spirit is going to exist on this world, world until judgment day. Here's where it shows up, Genesis 11, verse 4. Because they didn't want to worship God the way, they didn't think he was good enough and want to worship him the way he wanted to be worshipped. So they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves that's that babylonian mentality is me Let's make a name for myself it's what i want what's good for what's good for me and you got to be careful with this whole self-focus even in in like christian circles i think that there that some people are more concerned about followers than they are worshipers and and even the way that we do worship some of our worship like even the songs that we sing you know there's 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 a type of song a worship that you're, that you're singing that is God-oriented. It's God is the focus. You're worshiping God for his attributes and his character and his love and who he is and what he's done and he's the focus. And then there's another type of worship that is worshiping, it is declaring truth over yourself in light of who God is. And that's very, it's, it's biblical. The Psalms often do that. When David writes the Psalms, he's, he's declaring who God is. And then, you know, worshiping for who God is and declaring over his life because of who God is and reminding himself of that truth. And, and that's biblical in balance. But in a lot of our worship today, I think that self is more of a focus than God. So here's my challenge to you. Here's my challenge. For those of you that actually have like a worship playlist or something. Go through your worship songs that you love the most, or maybe you, what are the worship songs you like the most? Go through those songs, look at the lyrics. Who is the focal point? Is it you or God? I'm not saying like, it's, it's okay to declare over yourself, but we only declare over ourselves in light of who he is, I can declare who I am. So there's got to be a balance to that. See, I think that for a lot of us, you may find that you really, really like worshiping about you. Not so much worshiping God for who he is. We like declaring who we are. Oh, you feel me, love me, thank you for giving me, 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 me. Yeah, it's, it's just, okay? So you got to be careful. This, this focus of self, if you continue to operate that way, when, when the authority does come in and actually gets the focus off of you because it ain't about you, then you're at, you will be less likely to submit to that authority. So heightened focus on self. And then number three is trusting my feelings. Another reason why we just don't accept the authority of God's word in our life. We just trust our own feelings. If it feels right, do it. Oh, feel, but it feels right. Here's what Judges says. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. At that time, there was no king in Israel. And because of that, the people did whatever they felt like doing. Whatever was right in their own eyes. And it goes on to say that because of that, there was so much destruction and disorder when you don't live your life with a king, there will always be destruction and disorder. But we do have a king, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the king and the authority in our life. I don't get to choose how I live my life, what I do. I have a king that I submit to that has the authority in my life. Let me show you a verse that shows how important it is to accept the authority of God's word in your life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13. He says, we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, and that's another Greek word that's just packed with meaning. The Greek word for received is dekomai, and it means to be welcomed like a stranger. So it's like you, you saw a stranger, you're just like, okay, come on in. So here's what he's commending them about, that, that you received the word of God. You welcomed the word of God into your life like a stranger, meaning you didn't understand it, you didn't fully get it, 
You didn't even know what it was all about. But if God said it, I'm going to believe it. Get on in my life. Come on in here. You're just, I'm just, come on in. I'm going to welcome you like a stranger. You're, you're, you're God's word. When, and then he says this. You received the word of God which you heard from us and you accepted it. Not as the word from men, but as it actually is. This is the word of God. Which is now because of the way that you welcomed it. You received it. You accepted it. There's power inside of it now to accomplish something. Which is at work now in you who believe. And some of you might say, well, Jason, it just didn't work. Okay, but, but did you accept it? Did you accept that authority in your life and submit to it? Because when you accept it, power comes alongside of it to fulfill the purpose inside of that word. Now, this is so important. I can't even go on to the next points of this rhythm of God's word if, if we don't have this under, to accept the authority of the word of God in our life. Here at Discovery, we believed in the closed canon of scripture, meaning that this is complete. God's word is complete. Nothing can be taken away from it or added to it. It is supreme as it stands, the authority of God. Everything we do here, preach here, and teach here needs to be grounded in the word of God. Don't take my word for it. Go back to the word. Don't take any preacher's word for it. Go back to the word of God. we got to accept its authority. Now, after I do that, if I accept its authority, now, number two, I, I can start assimilating its truth. You know what to assimilate means? It, it means that you got to work it into all the areas of your life. So it's not just a Sunday thing for me. And it's not just a first 15 minutes of my day thing for me. I'm going to work it into, I'm going to assimilate this truth of God's word into every area of my life. Which is why we have like a couple's marriage or, or couple's conference coming up. So that you can work the word of God. You can assimilate God's truth into your marriage. We got groups coming up and they're studying all kinds of things so that you can assimilate the truth of God. So we have a financial peace university every season. So that you can assimilate the truth of God's word into your finances. Like you got to put, you got to assimilate it to every area of your life. Here's how you do it. How do you assimilate God's truth in, the, in his word into your life? Here's how. Number one, by listening to God's word. It's important to read the word, but you also have to listen. Be in the position to listen. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here and you're, you're listening, I realize that, but let me just reiterate how important it is to strategically listen to your word. And it just blows my mind how many people don't prioritize going to church. I just, I don't get it. And I'm not trying to build a church, you guys. I'm trying to build you, all right. It, it, but one guy told me, he said, wow, that was a great word, Pastor. I'm so glad I came today. I said, what do you mean? You, get, you, you weren't planning on it? It wasn't on your schedule to come? And he goes, well, no, we just decided last minute. I'm like, look, come, look, it's time to get this on your schedule. Jesus had a rhythm and a practice of being in the house of God every week. That was the rhythm of Jesus. Romans chapter 10, 17. Here's why we need to hear the word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to get this word inside of you, inside of your ears. I don't know about you, but I've just made a decision. I'm going to be at church on Sunday. And you guys are like, you the pastor though, wait up now. Before I was the pastor, I decided, like I wouldn't miss a Sunday. I am going to be in the house of God because I need this faith thing activated in my life. Here's the second way, not only listening to God's word, but number two, by reading God's word. By reading, and this is the obvious one, but you read it. Read it um, like a meal. I encourage people to read it like a meal. Every time you're going to eat, open up your word. Because every time you feed yourself physically, you need to feed yourself spiritually. Because you, it's like your spiritual food. This is what Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus answered, it is written, man shouldn't live on Chipotle alone. You don't live on, on just the bread, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So really practically now, and I'm going to challenge you to do this. I want you to do three things. How to create a rhythm of God's word and building your life this year. Getting in the right direction, arriving at the right destination at the end of this year. Three things. Number one, I want you to choose a time. Like today. Choose a time where you're going to get into God's word. Put it on your calendar. Put it on your schedule. Don't let anything get in the way of the time that you select. I'm a big advocate for a morning time. 
I advocate for that, but you don't need to do that. You don't need to do it like me. I just see that was the rhythm of Jesus, the practice of Jesus. He got up early and got away, so I try to practice that. But what's most important is you just have a time, and you stick to that time. Choose a time, all right? And I want you to do that today. Today, choose a time. And then number two, choose an actual place. Like the place you're going to go to. Jesus had his his favorite places, silent, solitary places to go to, to have quiet time with God. So where's that place? Let me give you some instruction here. It should be free from distraction and quiet. So don't try to have, a, don't try to have your time in the living room with the TV on and the kids getting ready and stuff. Get away. Get, if you have to go to a closet, I don't care. Get into a closet. But get away. I go to my office and I even have a chair. I said, that's my chair. I sit in that chair. And I put on some worship, and I have my quiet time, I read my, read my devotion. I know a friend, a pastor friend of mine, actually has his own office, his own chair, but he takes it to another level. He, he, he has a candle he lights every, every day, lights the same candle. He says, it's a manly candle, though. It's just, he says, it smells, it smells manly. But choose a time and a place for you to go to, right? And then, number three, choose a plan. Like, get a Bible reading plan in your life, something to keep track, keep consistent, go to. I do the one-year Bible reading plan. You can do that. It's on the Version Bible app. You can do whatever plan, but just choose it. And here's, let me give you some wisdom on the plan. If you miss some days or some weeks or a month or a couple of months, I had someone come to me and be like, Pastor, I'm trying to catch up, man. I'm, I'm still in last year in May. So I'm like, no, don't do that. Just pick it up right here, right today, today. Just read today. Pick that up. Don't live underneath all that to-do list, dude. <laughs> which, is, which is why don't just read the Bible. Let the Bible read you. The goal isn't to re- check it off, check it off, get caught up for the reading and the list and the day. No. The goal is for that word of God to be living and active and to do the surgery and healing it needs to do inside of my life. So I'm going to hear it. I'm going to read it. And then number three, I'm going to study God's word. Studying is a little bit different than reading. It's actually digging deeper into that chapter, into that word. Like what is, like we're talking about meditation today. I'm going to read every verse, which I did for this message. Every verse about meditation, every verse about revelation. Every, I'm just going to study what God has to say about that. We live in a day and age where all this information is readily available. Everything that I've given you, Hebrew, Greek, commentaries, all the stuff, everything that I share with you is actually available to you. Everything. All right, you don't need to go to seminary to, to give you what I, you, now yes, I spend probably about 12 to 15 hours of study every week, but, but it's still available, it's available to you. This information is available, you, gotta st- you just have to make the time to study. I'm not saying give 12 hours, but I'm saying dig into the word of God. Study the word. Here's why, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm going to help you out with that actually this week in our devos. I'm going to help you study and learn how to study your word. Here's what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says. All scripture is what? It's God breathed. This is the breath of God, you guys. This is getting him to breathe on your life, man. Getting the refreshing wind and power of God. All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, that's you, that's me, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God has a good plan for your life, good works for your life, and he wants to equip you to do what he's called you to do through the counsel of his word. So study the word. I got to accept its authority. I I, I have to, um, I got to accept its authority. I got to assimilate its truth. And then number three, I told you I got a whole bunch of sub points. I got to apply its principles. So I'm not just going to let it be information. I need, I got to apply it so it can become transformation. A lot of us have a lot of information. But the reason why it's not transformation is because you're missing a step of application. James chapter 1, tells it like this. Don't merely just listen to the word and just deceive yourselves. Like just because you know it, that you're good. No, do what it says. Use it in your life. Don't be checking the box of Christianity. Do what it says. Can we start right there together? Come on, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd love to pray with you to get this rhythm started in your life. A life built on the word of God. Let me start right here. With every head bowed and eye closed. Don't put nothing away just yet. Let me just have a moment with you. Just be in prayer. Some of you have never submitted 
to the authority of King Jesus. Like the authority of, of Jesus in your life or his word. Like you are the authority of your life. The Lord of your life. And really that's what it means to make Jesus Lord of your life. Is to give him authority. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It, he is the authority. And you believe that God's, God raised him from the dead. Then you shall be saved. This is how salvation meets you. Your, your fresh start meets you by giving up your authority, surrendering to his authority. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you've never done that, but there is somewhere in this service, there was that aha moment. You could see it now. There was rhema. Something became alive to you that you need Jesus, that he is Lord. Created you, called you, made you for a purpose. You know it right now. You sense it. It's alive. Rhema happened. I'd love to help you make a decision today to give him the authority of your life and get a fresh start. Some of you need to make that decision again today, but I'd love to pray with you. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or sing to you out, but just right where you are, I'd love to, I'd love to lead you in a prayer. Here's what we're going to do. On the count of three, I'm just going to have you raise your hand. I want you to lift it up high if you're ready for a fresh start. If you're ready to start going in the right direction, man, this is it. It begins right here. Who's the authority of your life? Is it him or you? With every head bowed and eye closed. Come on, on the count of three. Be bold. One, two, three. Lift that hand up. I submit to him. Today, I'm surrendering the authority of my life. Yes, all over this place. Lift it real high. Come on, be bold. I want to see. I want to see. Yes, all over this place. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. God, you, 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 you. I submit. I surrender. Go ahead and put your hand down. Can I help lead you in a prayer? To just do just that. Invite him in. You just say this with your own heart, but I can help you with the words right now. Say something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Today I surrender, and I give you control. I give you authority. I submit to you. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Today I declare you are my Lord and Savior. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, I speak over every person that this year they would have a rhythm of your word, that they would build their life on the solid rock. And when storms come, and they will come, and the rain comes of 2022, and it will come, that they're going to be standing strong, God. God, I pray that this year they would assimilate every area of their, of their life, your truth and your word to every area. They would not hide parts of their life from you like you do not see. God, no part of your word, your commands are for you. They're all for me. They're all for our good and for our benefit, every one of them. So God, to this year, help us to assimilate your truth and apply your word to every area of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen. Amen. All right, just stay seated just a couple more minutes.